This was Sebastian's garden. The Latin names for the plants were printed on tags attached to them, but the prints fading out. Those ones there are some of the oldest plants on Earth. Survivors from the age of the giant fern forests. Of course, in this semi-tropical climate, some of the rarest plants, such as the Venus flytrap. Do you know what this is, Dr. the Venus flytrap? An insectivorous plant? Yes, it feeds on insects. It has to be kept under glass from early fall to late spring. And when it went under glass, my son Sebastian had to provide it with fruit flies flown in at great expense from a Florida laboratory that used fruit flies for experiments in genetics. Well, I can't do that. Not that I can't. I, I just can't do it. it. It's not the expense, but the... Effort. So, goodbye, Venus flytrap. Oh, oh, dear, do you know, I, I don't know why, but I already feel I can lean on your shoulder, Dr. Su Sue. Sue Krovitz. It's a Polish word. It means sugar. So let's keep it simple and call me Dr. Sugar. <laughs> well, now, Dr. Sugar. <laughs> well, you've seen Sebastian's garden. It's like a well-groomed jungle. Oh, that's how he meant it to be. Nothing was accidental. Everything was planned and designed in Sebastian's life and his work. What was your son's work, Mrs. Venable? I mean, besides garden. As many times as I've had to answer that question, do you know it still shocks me a little to realize that Sebastian Venable, the poet, is still unknown outside a small coterie of friends, including his mother? Oh. I mean, strictly speaking, his life was his occupation. I see. No, oh, no, no, you don't see. But before I'm through, you will. Sebastian was a poet. That's what I meant when I said his life was his work. Because the work of a poet is the life of a poet, and vice versa, the life of a poet is the work of a poet. I mean, you can't separate them. I mean, well, for instance, a salesman's work is one thing, and his life is another, or can be. The same thing is true of doctor, lawyer, merchant, thief, but a poet's life is his work in a special sense. Oh. I've already talked myself breathless and dizzy. <laughs> Mrs. Venable, did your doctor okay this thing? What thing? You're meeting the girl you feel is responsible for your son's death. I've waited months to face her. Because I couldn't get to St. Mary's to face her, I've had her brought here to my house. I won't collapse. She'll collapse. I mean, her lies will collapse. Not my truth. Not the truth. Forward march, Dr. Sugar. Oh. Oh, we've made it. <laughs> I didn't know I was so weak on my pins. Sit down, Doctor. I'm not afraid of using every last ounce and inch of my little leftover strength in doing just what I'm doing. I'm devoting all that's left of my life, Doctor, to the defense of a dead poet's reputation. Sebastian had no public name as a poet. He didn't want one. He refused to have one. He dreaded abhorred false values that come from being publicly known, from fame, from personal exploitation. He'd say to me, Violet, Mother, you're gonna outlive me. What made him think that? Poets are always clairvoyant. And he had rheumatic fever when he was 15, and he... It affected a heart valve, and he wouldn't stay off horses and out of water and so forth. Violet, mother, you're gonna live longer than me, and then when I'm gone, it will be yours, in your hands, to do just as you please with. Meaning, of course, his future recognition that he did want. He wanted it after his death, when it wouldn't disturb him. Then he did want to offer his work to the world. All right. Have I made my point, Doctor? Well, here is my son's work, Doctor. Here is his life going on. Poem of summer? Poem of summer. And the date of the summer. There were 25 of them. 
He wrote one poem a year, which he printed himself on an 18th century hand press at his atelier in the French Quarter. So no one but he could see it. He wrote one poem a year. One for every summer we traveled together. The other nine months of the year were really only a preparation. Nine months? The length of a pregnancy, yes. And the poem was hard to deliver? Yes, even with me. Without me, impossible, Doctor. He wrote no poem last summer. He died last summer. Without me, he died last summer. That was his last summer poem. When long ago summer... Now, why am I thinking of this? My son Sebastian said, Mother, listen to this. And he read me Herman Melville's description of the Encantadas, the Galapagos Islands. Quote, take five and twenty heaps of cinders dumped here and there in an outside silly lot. Imagine some of them magnified into mountains and the vacant lot the sea. And you'll have a fit idea of the general aspect of the Encantadas. The Enchanted Isles. Extinct volcanoes. Looking much as the world at large might look after a last conflagration. He read me that description and said that we have to go there. And so we did go there. And a chartered boat, a four-masted schooner, as close as possible to the sort of boat Melville must have sailed on. We saw the Encantadas, but... On the Encantadas, we saw something Melville hadn't written about. We saw the great sea turtles crawl up out of the sea for the annual egg laying. Once a year, the female of the sea turtle crawls up out of the equatorial sea onto the blazing sand beach of a volcanic island to dig a pit in the sand and deposit her eggs there. It's a long and dreadful thing the depositing of the eggs. And when it's finished, the exhausted female crawls back into the sea, half dead. She never sees her offspring, but we did. Sebastian knew exactly when the sea turtle eggs would be hatched out, and we returned in time to see it. You went back to the... Terrible encantadas in time to witness the hatching of the sea turtles and their desperate flight to the sea. The narrow beach, the color of caviar, was all in motion, but the sky was in motion, too, full of flesh-eating birds. And the noise of the birds, the horrible, savage cries of the Carnivorous birds. Over the long, narrow, black heath of the Encantadas. As the just hatched sea turtles scrambled out of the sand pits and started their race to the sea. Race to the sea? To escape the flesh eating birds that made the sky almost as black as the beach. And the sand was all alive. All alive as the hatched sea turtles made their dash for the sea while the, the birds hovered and swooped to attack and hovered and swooped to attack, diving down on the hatched sea turtles, turning them over to expose their soft undersides, tearing the undersides open and rending them, eating their flesh. Sebastian guessed that possibly only a hundredth of one percent of their number made the escape to the sea. What was it about that spectacle on the beach that fascinated your son? My son was looking for... Let's just say he was interested in sea turtles. That's not what you started to say. I stopped myself in time. Say what you started to say. I started to say that my son was looking for God. And I stopped myself because I thought you'd think, oh, a pretentious young crackpot, which Sebastian was not. Mrs. Venable, doctors look for God, too. Oh. Let me tell you something. The first operation I performed at Lion's View... Yes? 
The patient was a young girl, regarded as hopeless, and after the operation, I stayed with the girl as if I delivered a child that might stop breathing. When they finally wheeled her out of the surgery, I still stayed with her. It was a nice afternoon, and the moment we wheeled her outside, she whispered something. She whispered, oh, how blue the sky is. And I felt proud, because up until then, her speech, everything she'd babbled, had been a torrent of obscenities. Yes, well, now, I can tell you without hesitation, my son was looking for God. I mean, for a clear image of him. He spent that whole blazing equatorial day in the crow's nest of the schooner watching this thing on the beach till it was too dark to see it. And when he came down the rigging, he said, well, now I've seen him, and he meant God. For several weeks after that, he had a fever. He was delirious with it. Shall I go on from there? Yes, please. I took command of the ship, and we sailed north by east into cooler waters. India, China, the Himalayas. Oh, God. The elixir. Any kind of a drugstore to keep me alive. <laughs> Where was I? In the Himalayas. Oh, that long ago summer. Well, in the Himalayas, he almost entered a Buddhist monastery. He had gone so far as to shave his head and eat just rice out of a wood bowl on a grass mat. He promised those sly Buddhist monks he'd give up himself and the world and all his worldly possessions to their mendicant order. Well, I gave what his father. For God's sake, notify a bank to freeze Sebastian's account. I got back with Cable, Mr. Venable, critically ill, stop. Once you stop, needs you stop. Immediate return advised most strongly, stop. Did you go back to your husband? I, I made the hardest decision of my life. I stayed with my son. I got him through that crisis, too. Within a month, he'd got up off that filthy grass mat and thrown the rice bowl away and booked us into Shepherd's Hotel, Cairo, and the Ritz in Paris. And from then on, oh, we, we still lived in a world of light and shadow, but the shadow was almost as luminous as the light. Don't you want to sit down now? Indeed I do, before I fall down. <laughs> Are your hind legs still on you? My what? Oh, uh, hind legs, <laughs> yes. And you're not a donkey. You're certainly not a donkey because I've been talking the hind legs off a donkey, several donkeys. I had to make it clear to you that the world Lost a great deal, too, when I lost my son last summer. He would have liked my son. He would have been charmed by you. My son Sebastian was not a family snob or money snob, but he was a snob, all right. He was a snob about personal charm in people. He insisted upon good looks in people around him always, wherever he was. Here in New Orleans or New York or in Paris and Venice. I always had an entourage of the beautiful and the talented and the young. Your son was young, Mrs. Venable? Both of us were young, Doctor, and stayed young. Could I see a photograph of your son? Oh, indeed you could, Doctor. I'm glad you asked to see one through there. I'm going to show you not one photograph, but two in here. In here. Here's my son, Sebastian, in the Renaissance page boy's costume and a mass ball in calm. Here's my son, Sebastian, in the same costume and a mass ball in Venice. Those two pictures were taken 20 years apart. Now, which one is the older doctor? 
This photograph looks older. The photograph looks older, but not the subject. It takes character to refuse to grow old. Doctor, successfully to refuse to, it calls for discipline, abstention. One cocktail before dinner, not two, four, six. A single lean chop and lime juice on a salad in restaurants famed for rich dishes. Miss Venable? Miss Holly's mother and brother are here. Holly and brother. Holly, dear, we're here, they're here. Wait upstairs in my upstairs living room for me. Get them upstairs. I don't want them here during this talk. Mrs. Venable, did your son have a... What kind of a personal or well, private life did your That's son... That's a question I wanted you to ask me. Why? I haven't heard the girl's story, except indirectly in a watered-down version, being too ill to go to hear it directly. But I've gathered enough to know that it is a hideous attack on my son's moral character. Which, being dead, he can't defend himself from. I have to be the defender. Now sit down. Listen to me. Now, before you hear whatever you're going to hear from the girl when she gets here, my son, Sebastian, was chaste. Not C-H-A-S-E-D. Oh, well, he was chaste in that way of spelling it, too. We had to be very fleet-footed, I can tell you, with his looks and his charm to keep ahead of pursuers. Every kind of pursuer. No, I mean he was C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste. I understood what you meant, Mrs. Vettel. And you believe me, don't you? Yes, but... But what? Chastity. At what age was your son last summer? Oh, Forty. Maybe we really didn't count birthdays. And he lived a celibate life? As strictly as if he'd vowed to. <laughs> this sounds like vanity, Doctor, but really... I was actually the only one in his life that satisfied the demands he made of people. Time after time, my son would let people go, dismiss them because their... their... their attitude was... Not as pure as... My son Sebastian demanded. Oh, we were a famous couple. People didn't speak of Sebastian and his mother or... Mrs. Venable and her son, they'd say, Sebastian and Violet. Violet and Sebastian are staying at the Lido. They're at the Ritz in Paris. Sebastian and Violet. Violet and Sebastian have taken a house for the season at Pierrette's. On every appearance, every time we appeared, attention was centered on us. Everyone else eclipsed. Vanity? No, you couldn't call it that, Doctor. I didn't call it that. It wasn't folly de grandeur. It was grandeur. I see. An attitude toward life that's hardly been known in the world since the great Renaissance princes were crowded out of their palaces and gardens by successful shopkeepers. I see. And most people's lives, what are they but trails of debris? Each day, more debris, more debris, long, long trails of debris with nothing to clean it all up but finally death. My son, Sebastian, and I constructed our days. Each day, we would carve out each day of our lives like a piece of sculpture. Yes, we left behind us a trail of days like a gallery of sculpture. But last summer, I can't forgive him for it. Even now, he's paid for it with his life. He let in this vandal, this... The girl that... that you're going to meet here this afternoon, he admitted this vandal, and with her tongue for a hatchet, she's gone about smashing our legend. The memory... Mrs. Venable, what do you think is her reason? Lunatics don't have reason. I mean, what do you think is her motive? <laughs> what a question. We put the bread in her mouth and the clothes on her back. People that like you for that, or even forgive you for it, are hen's teeth, Doctor. The role of the benefactor is worse than thankless. It's the role of a victim, Doctor. A sacrificial victim. Yes, they want your blood, Doctor. They want your blood on the altar steps of their outraged, outrageous egos. Oh, you mean she resented them? Loathed. 
They can't shut her up at St. Mary's. I thought she'd been there for months. I mean, keep her still there. She babbles. They couldn't shut her up in Cabeza de Lobo or at the clinic in Paris. She babbles, babbles, smashing my son's reputation. On the Berengaria, bringing her back to the States, she broke out of the stateroom and babbled. Babbled, even at the airport when she was flown down here. She babbled a bit of her story before they could whisk her into an ambulance to St. Mary's. This is a reticule, Doctor. Catch-all, carry-all bag for an elderly lady that I turned into last summer. Would you open it for me? My hands are stiff. Mm. Fish out some cigarettes. And a cigarette holder. Oh, I don't have any matches. I think there's a table lighter on the table. Yeah, there is. My lord. What a torch. Mm. So shines a good deed in a naughty world, Dr. Sugar. My stick. Mrs. Venable. Yes? In your letter last week, you made some reference to a, to a fund of some kind, to an endowment. I wrote you that my lawyers and bankers and certified public accountants were setting up the Sebastian Venable Memorial Foundation to subsidize the work of young people like you that are pushing out the frontiers of art and science but have a financial problem. You have a financial problem, don't you, Doctor? Yes, we do. My work is such a new and radical thing that the people in charge of the state funds are naturally a bit scared of it and they keep us on a small budget, so small. That we need a separate ward for my patients. I don't mean to turn you against my work at Lion's View, but I have to be honest with you. There's a good deal of risk in my operation. Whenever you enter the brain with a foreign object. Yes. Even a needle-thin knife and a yes. skilled surgeon's fingers. Yes. Well, there's a good deal of risk involved in the operation. You said it pacifies them, it quiets them down, it suddenly makes them peaceful. Yes, it does that. That much we already know, but... But what? Well, it'll be ten years before we can tell if the immediate effects of the operation will be lasting, or passing, or even if there'd still be... And this is what haunts me about it. Any possibility afterwards of reconstructing a totally sound person. It may be that the person will always be limited afterwards, relieved of any acute disturbances, but limited, Mrs. Venable. But what a blessing to them, Doctor, to be just peaceful, to be just suddenly peaceful. After all that horror, after those nightmares, just to be able to lift up their eyes and see a sky not as black with savage, devouring birds as the sky we saw in the Encantadas, Doctor. Mrs. Venable, I can't guarantee that a lobotomy will stop her babbling. Maybe, maybe not. But after the operation, who would believe her, Doctor? My God. Mrs. Venable, supposing after meeting the girl and observing the girl and hearing the story she babbles, I still shouldn't feel that her condition's intractable enough to justify the risks of... Supposing that I shouldn't feel that non-surgical treatments such as insulin shock, electric shock... She's had all that at St. Mary's. Nothing else is left for her. And if I disagree with you? That's just part of a question. Finish the question, Doctor. Would you still be interested in my work at Lion's View? I mean, would the Sebastian Venable Memorial Foundation still be interested in it? Are we always more interested in a thing that concerns us personally, Doctor? Mrs. Venable, you are such an 
innocent person that it doesn't occur to you. It obviously hasn't even occurred to you that anyone less innocent than you are might interpret this offer of a subsidy as, well, as sort of a bribe. <laughs> Name it that. If you like, I don't care. There are just two things to remember. She's a destroyer. My son was a creator. Now, if my honesty is shocked, you pick up your little black bag and run away out of this garden without the subsidy in it. Nobody's heard our conversation but you and I, Dr. Sugar. Miss Venable? What? What is it, Miss Fox here? Miss Venable, Miss Holly is here with... My oh, God, there she is. I told you to meet them at the door and lead them around the side of the house, and you didn't listen. <laughs> in the garden if you wish to or run out of the garden if you wish to or go in this way if you wish to or do anything that you wish to but I'm going to have my five o'clock daiquiri frozen before I face her be still till your family comes down Excuse I'm me. sorry that box on the table. Just a cigarette. Put it back in the box. It's too late. It's already lighted. Give it here. Please let me smoke. Give it here. Sister Felicity. Catherine, give it here. You know that you're not allowed to smoke at St. Mary's. We're not at St. Mary's. This is an afternoon now. You're still in my charge. I can't permit you to smoke because the last time you smoked, you dropped a lighted cigarette in your dress and started a fire. I did not start a fire. I just burned a hole in my skirt because I was half unconscious on Catherine, give it here. Don't be such a bully. Disobedience has to be paid for later. All right, I'll pay for it later. <laughs> Catherine, give me that cigarette or I'll make a report that'll put you right back on the violent ward if you don't. I'm not being violent, sister. Give me that cigarette. I'm holding my hand out for it. All right, take it. Here, take it. Ah! You burned me with it. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. You deliberately burned me. You said give it to you, and so I gave it you to you. You stuck the lighted end of that cigarette in my hand. I'm sick. I'm sick of being bossed and bullied. Oh, sit down! There goes the wearing mixer. And Violet's about to have a five o'clock frozen daiquiri. You could set a watch by it. We're in Sebastian's house. Did you have any medication before you went out? No, I didn't have any. Will you give me some, sister? I can't. I wasn't told to. However, I think the doctor will give you something. The young man I bumped into? Yes, the young doctor's a specialist from another hospital. What hospital? A word to the wise is sufficient. I knew I was being watched. He's staring at me. Sit down and be still. Your family's coming outside. Is it Lion's View, Doctor? Oh, Lion's View, is it, Doctor? Oh. When can I stop running down that steep white street like the birds in the road? Oh, Catherine, do be still. I loved him, sister. Why wouldn't he let me save him? I tried to hold on his hand, but he struck it away and ran, ran, ran in the wrong direction, oh, sister. Catherine, dear, sit down. <laughs> Bless you, sister. Thank you. The doctor's still there. He can't hide. He catches the light. He shines through the shutters. His eyes are so blue. I went away in blonde. We were going to Blondes next. Blondes were next on the menu. Oh, be still now, uh, quiet, dear. Cousin Sebastian said he was famished for Blondes, fed up with the dark ones and famished for Blondes. All the travel brochures he picked up were advertisements of the blonde northern countries. Fed up with the dark ones, famished for the light ones. That's how he talked about people, as if they were atoms on a menu. 
That one's delicious looking. Or that one's appetizing. Or that one's not appetizing. I think because he was really nearly half starved from living on pills and salads. Oh, stop it, Catherine, be still. He liked me, so I loved him. Why wouldn't he let me save him? <laughs> Cousin Sebastian suddenly said to me last summer, let's fly north, little bird. I want to walk under those radiant, cold northern lights. I've never seen the aurora borealis. Somebody said or wrote once, we're all of us children in a vast kindergarten, trying to spell God's name with the wrong alphabet blocks. I think it's me they're calling. They call me sister, sister. Sister! 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 Catherine, dear! Catherine! Mama, doesn't she look fine, George? Uh-huh. They send you to the beauty parlor whenever you're gonna have a family visit. Other times you look just awful. They won't let you have a... Lipstick or a compact or anything made out of metal because they're afraid that she'll swallow it. Well, I think she looks just splendid, don't you, George? Can't we talk to her without the nun for a minute? Yes, I'm sure we can. Sister? Excuse me. Sister Felicity, this is my mother, Mrs. Harley, and my brother, George. How do you do? How do you do? This is Sister Felicity. We're so happy that Kathy's at St. Mary's. So very grateful for all that you're doing for her. We do the best we can for her, Mrs. Holly. I'm sure you do. I wonder if you would mind if we had a little private chat with our Kathy. I'm not supposed to let her out of my sight. It's just for a minute. You can sit in the hall or in the garden, and we'll call you right back here the minute the private part of our talk is over. Jesus! What are you trying to do, huh? Sister, George. are you trying to ruin us? George, will you be quiet? You're upsetting your sister. How elegant George looks. George has inherited Cousin Sebastian's wardrobe, but everything else is in probate. Did you know that? That everything else is in probate? And Violet can keep it in probate just as long as she wants to. Where is Aunt Violet? George, come back here. Violet's on her way down. Oh, yeah. Aunt Violet has an elevator now. Yes, she has. She's had an elevator installed. And sister is the cutest little thing you ever did see. It's all paneled in Chinese lacquer, black and gold Chinese lacquer with lovely bird pictures. There's only room for one at a time, so George and I came down on foot. I think she's having her frozen daiquiri now. She still has a frozen daiquiri promptly at five o'clock every afternoon in the world in warm weather. Sister... The horrible death of Sebastian just about killed her. She's now slightly better with the question of time. Dear, you know, I'm sure you understand why we haven't been out to see you at St. Mary's. They said that you were too disturbed and that a family visit might disturb you more. <laughs> but I want you to know that nobody, absolutely nobody in the city now think about what you've been through. Haven't you? Not a thing. Now, sister. I want you, please, to be very careful about what you say to Aunt Violet about what happened to Sebastian in Cabeza de Lobo. What do you want me to say about what... Just don't repeat that same fantastic story. For my sake, George's sake, for the sake of your brother and mother, don't repeat that horrible story again. Not to Aunt Violet, will you? Then I, I'm going to have to tell Aunt Violet what happened to her son in Cabeza de Lobo last summer. Honey, that's why you're here. She has insisted on hearing it from you. You were the only witness to it, Kathy. No, there were others that ran. 
Oh, sister, you've just been having some sort of little nightmare about it. Now, listen to me, will you? Sebastian has left, has bequeathed to you and George in his will. To each of us, 50 grand each after taxes. Get it? Oh, yes, but if they give me an injection, I won't have any choice but to tell exactly what happened in Cabeza de Lobo last summer. Don't you see? I won't have any choice but to tell the truth. It makes you tell the truth because it shuts something off that might make you able not to, and everything comes out, decent or not decent. You have no control, but always, always the truth. Catherine Dolan. I don't know the full story, but surely you're not too sick in your head to know in your heart that the story that you're telling is just... Kathy, too... Kathy, you've got to forget that story, can't you? For your 50 grand. Because if Anne Vaughn contests the will, and we know she will, she'll keep it in the courts forever. It's in probate now, and it'll never get out of probate until you drop that story. We can't afford to hire lawyers good enough to contest it. So if you don't stop telling that crazy story, we won't have a pot to cut brains in. <laughs> Catherine, don't laugh like that. Scare us, me, Catherine. Doctor. Doctor. Telephone. Okay. The money is all tied up. If Aunt Vi decided to contest Sebastian's will that leaves us all of this cash, am I coming through to you, sister? Yes, little brother. You are. See, Mama, she's crazy like a coyote. We won't get a single damn penny. Honest to God, we won't. So you just got to stop telling that story about what you say happened to Cousin Sebastian and Cabeza de Lobo, even if it's what it couldn't be. True. Kathy, why, why, why did you invent such a tale? But, Mother, I didn't invent it. I know it's a hideous story, but it's a true story of our time and the world we live in and what did truly happen to Cousin Sebastian and Cabeza de Lobo. Oh, so you are going to tell it. You see, Mama, she's going to tell it. Write to Aunt Vi and lose us a hundred thousand. Kathy, you are a bitch. Jump! I repeat it, a bitch. She ain't crazy, Mama. She's no more crazy than I am. She's just, just perverse. Always perverse. George! George! Apologize to your sister. This is no way to talk to your sister. You come right back over here and tell your sweet little sister you're so sorry that you have spoke to her like that. I'm sorry, Kathy, but you know we need that money. Mama and me. Kathy, I got ambitions. <laughs> Kathy, I'm young. I want things. I need them, Kathy. So will you please think about me, us? calling for me. Catherine, George put it very badly, but you know it's true, dear, that we do have to get what Sebastian left us in his will, dearest. And you won't let us down. Promise, you won't let us down. Here comes Aunt Vi. Mama, Kathy, Aunt Vi. Here comes Aunt Vi. Kathy, here's Aunt She sees me, and I see her. That's all that's necessary. Put my chair over there. Crank the back up a little. More. More! Not that much, but back down. All right, now then. I'll have my frozen daiquiri now. Do any of you want coffee? I'd like chocolate malt. George. This isn't a drugstore. <laughs> George is just being George. <laughs> That's what I thought he was being. Yeah. 
here's the portfolio Mark Cabeza de Lobo. It has all your correspondence with the police there and the American cards. I asked for the English transcript. It's in a separate... Separate? Yes, yes. Here it is. Oh. And here's the report from the private investigators. And here's the report from the... Yes, yes, yes. Where is the doctor? On the phone in the library. Why does he choose such a moment to make a phone call? He didn't make a phone call. He received Ms. a phone Parkson, call. Why are you talking to me like a burglar? She's frightened, Aunt Vi. Can I get up? Did George tell you he received bids from every good fraternity on the Tulane campus? And went Far dealt because Paul Jr. did. I see he had the natural tact and good taste to come here this afternoon, outfitted from head to foot in clothes that belong to my son. You gave them to me, Aunt Vi. I didn't know you'd parade them in front of me, George. George, tell Aunt Vi just how grateful you are. I found a little Jew tailor on Britannia Street that makes alterations so good you'd never guess they weren't cut out for me to begin with. I'm so reasonable. <laughs> Luckily, since it seems that Sebastian's wonderful, wonderful bequest to George and Kathy is going to be tied up a while. Aunt Vi, about the will. I was wondering if we can't figure out some way. George means to expedite it. Get through the red tape. I understand quickly. his meaning. Fox, go get the doctor. Doctor? Doctor? George, no more about money. Doctor? I don't want to see her again. What's wrong, dear? I think I'm just dreaming unless it doesn't seem real. To answer an urgent call from Lyons. We do. Fine. What for? I know what's coming. Why? You're prepared to put out a thousand a month plus extra charges for treatments to keep the girl at St. Mary's? Kathy. Kathy, dear. Tell Aunt Violet just how grateful you are for her making it possible for you to rest and recuperate in that sweet, sweet place, St. Mary's. Your place in Luna, Texas is a sweet, sweet place. But the food's good there. Isn't the food good there? Just give me written permission not to eat fried grits. I had yard privileges till I refused to eat fried grits. She lost yard privileges because she couldn't be trusted in the yard without constant supervision. Or even with it because she'd run to the fence and make signs to cars on the highway. Yes, I did. I did that because I've been trying for weeks to get a message out of that sweet, sweet play. What message, dear? What you scared of, sister? What they might do to me now after they've done all the rest. That man's a specialist from Lions View. We get the newspapers. I know what they're going to... I thought you'd left us with just that little black bag to remember you by. Oh, no. Don't you remember our little talk? I had to answer a phone call about... This is Dr. Sukrowitz. He says it means sugar, and we can call him sugar. <laughs> He's a specialist from Lions View. What does he specialize in? Something new when other treatments have failed. Do you want to bore a hole in my skull and turn a knife in my brain? Everything else was done to me. You'll need my mother's permission for that. I'm paying to keep you in a private asylum. You're not my legal guardian. Your mother is dependent on me. All of you are, financially. I think the situation is clear to me now. Good, in I that case. I think a quiet atmosphere will get us the best results. I don't know what you mean by a quiet atmosphere. She shouted, I didn't. Mrs. Venable, let's try to keep things on a quiet level now. Your niece seems to be distressed. She has every reason to be. She took my son away I from me. Me. you're not being fair. Oh, oh aren't I? She's not being fair. You know why Sebastian asked me to travel with him. I do them. know why. You weren't able to travel. You'd had a... Go on. What had I had? Are you afraid to say it in front of the doctor? She means that I had a stroke. I did not have a stroke! I had a slight aneurysm. You know what that is, doctor. A little vascular convulsion, not a hemorrhage, just a little convulsion of a blood vessel. I had it when I discovered she was trying to take my son away from me. Then I had it. It gave a, a temporary muscular contraction to one side of my face. You know, these, these people are not blood relatives of mine. They're my dead husband's relations. I always detested them. My dead husband's sister and her two worthless children. But I, I did more than my duty to keep their heads above water to please my son, who, whose weakness was being excessively soft-hearted. I went to the expense and humiliation, yes, public humiliation of giving this girl a debut 
which was a fiasco. No, no, nobody liked her when I brought her out. Oh, she had some sort of notoriety. She had a sharp tongue that some people mistook for wit. A habit of laughing in the faces of decent people, which would infuriate them and also reflected adversely on me. And, and Sebastian, too, but Sebastian was amused by this girl. Well, I was, I was disgusted. Second. And halfway through the season, she was dropped off the party list. Yes, dropped off the list in spite of my position. And why? Because she'd lost her head over a young married man, made a scandalous scene at a Mardi Gras ball in the middle of the ballroom, and everybody dropped her like a hot rock. But my, my son Sebastian still felt sorry for her and took her with him last summer instead I of me. I can't change truth. I'm not God. I'm not even sure that he could. I don't think God can change the truth. How can I change the story of what happened to her son in comparison to the Let me go back to St. Mary's. That is not where you're I'm going. I'm lying to you. You know that you are. That was my hand. Don't call me, Auntie. That's my daughter. I don't want to. I didn't want to come here. I know what she thinks. She thinks that I murdered her son. She thinks that I was responsible for his death. That's right. I told him when he told me that he was taking you with him instead of me, that I'd never see him again, and I never did, and only you know why. Venable, I need to be left alone with Miss Catherine for a few minutes. George. Talk to her. George. And by Kathy can't go to Lion's View. Everyone in the garden district would know you put your niece in a state asylum, Aunt Vi. Fox. What do you want, Aunt Vi? I let go of my chair. Fox, so get me away from people. Aunt Vi, listen. Think of the talk. I can't get up. Push me away. Push me away. I'll push her, Miss Fox. Here. Would you let go of my chair? No, Mr. Holly! I need to talk to her. Fox, tell Mr. Holly, she does want you to push her. I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone with Aunt Vi. Would you let go of me or I'll strap you? Aunt Vi. Fox, sick woman. She had a stroke last spring. Yes, she did, but she'll never admit it. You have to understand why. I do understand why I didn't want to come here. Do you hate her, Miss Catherine? I don't understand what hate is. How can you hate anybody and still be sane? You see, I still think I'm sane, Doctor. You think she did have a stroke? She had a slight stroke last April. It just affected one side, the left side of her face, but it was disfiguring. And after that, Sebastian couldn't use her. Did you say use her? Yes, we all use each other, and that's what we think of as love. And not being able to use each other is what's hate. Do you hate her, Miss Catherine? Didn't you ask me that once? And didn't I tell you I don't understand what hate is? A ship struck an iceberg at sea. Everyone sinking. Go on, Miss Catherine. But that's... No reason for everyone drowning, for hating everyone drowning, is it, Doctor? 
What was your feeling for your cousin Sebastian? He liked me, so I loved him. In what way did you love him? The only way you'd accept a sort of motherly way. I try to save him, Doctor. From what? Save him from what? Completing a sort of image he had of himself as a sort of a sacrifice to a terrible sort of... God? Yes, a cruel one, Doctor. How did you feel about that? Doctor, my feelings are the sort of feelings you have in a dream. Your life doesn't seem real to you? Suddenly, last winter, I began to write my journal in the third person. Something happened last winter. At a Mardi Gras ball, some... some boy that took me to it got too drunk to stand up. And I wanted to go home. My coat was in the cloakroom. They couldn't find the check for it in his pockets. I said, oh, hell, let it go. I started out for a taxi. Somebody took my arm, said... I'll drive you home. He took off his coat as we left the hotel and put it over my shoulders, and then I looked at him. I don't think I'd ever seen him before then, really. He took me home in his car, but he took me to another place first. We stopped at the Dueling Oaks at the end of Esplanade Street. Stopped. I said, what for? And he didn't answer. Just struck a match in the car to light a cigarette in the car. And I looked at him in the car and I knew what for. I think I got out of the car before he got out of the car. We walked through the wet grass to the great misty oaks as if somebody was calling us for help. And then, after that, I lost him. He took me home, said an awful thing to me. We'd better forget it, he said. My wife's expecting a child, and I just entered the house, sat there thinking a little, and suddenly I called a taxi to and went right back to the Roosevelt Hotel ballroom. The ball was still going on. I thought I'd gone back to pick up my borrowed coat, but that wasn't what I'd gone back for. I'd gone back to make a scene on the floor of the hotel ballroom. Yes, I didn't stop at the cloakroom to pick up that Violet's old mink stole, no. I rushed right into the ballroom and spotted him on the floor, ran up to him and beat him as hard as I could on the face and chest with my fist. Cousin Sebastian took me away. After that, the next morning, I started writing my journal in the third person singular, such as she's still living this morning, meaning that I was or What's next for? God knows. I couldn't go out anymore. However, my cousin Sebastian suddenly came into my bedroom one morning and said, get up. Well, if you're still alive after dying, well then, you're obedient, doctor. I got up. He took me downtown to a place for passport photos, said, Mother can't go abroad with me this summer. You're going to go with me this summer instead of mother. If you don't believe me, read my journal of Paris. She woke up at daybreak this morning. Had her coffee, dressed, and took a brief walk. Who did? She did. I did. From the Hotel Plaza Athenae to the Place de l'Etoile, as if pursued by a pack of Siberian wolves. Went right through all the stop signs, couldn't wait for green signals. 
Where did she think she was going? Back to the dueling oaks. Everything chilly and dim, but his heart ravenous mouth. Miss Catherine, let me give you something. Do I have to have the injection again this time? What am I going to be stuck with this time, doctor? I don't care. I've been stuck so many times that if you connected me with a garden hose, I'd make a good sprinkler. Please take off your jacket. I didn't feel it. That's good. Shall I start counting backwards from a hundred? Do you like counting backwards? Love it. Just love it. One hundred, <clears throat> ninety-nine, ninety-eight, ninety-seven, ninety-six, ninety-five. Oh, I already feel it. How funny. <laughs> That's right. Now close your eyes. They say it's at the bottom of the bottom as well, you know. Truth. Where was I now? At 90? You don't have to count back. At, at 90 something? You can open your eyes. Oh, I do feel funny. You know what I think you're doing? I think you're trying to hypnotize me. You're looking so straight at me. You're doing something to me with your eyes. Your eyes. Is that what you're doing to me? Is that what you feel I'm doing? I feel so peculiar. And it's not just the drug. Give me all your resistance. You are totally passive. Yes, I am. You will do what I ask. Yes, I will try. You will tell the true story. Yes, I will. The absolutely true story. No lies. Nothing not spoken. Everything told exactly. Everything exactly. Because I have to. Can, can I stand up? Yes, but be careful. You might feel a little bit dizzy. <clears throat> oh, I can't. Tell me to, then I think I could. Stand up. <laughs> How funny. Now, now I can. Oh, I do feel dizzy. Help me. I'm, I'm about to fall off. <laughs> So you lost your balance. No, I didn't. I did what I wanted to without you telling me to. Let me. Let me. Let me. so lonely. If I've gone mad, it's lonelier than death. If I've gone mad, it's lonelier than death. Kathy! You've got a hell of a nerve. It's all right, sister. It may be all right for you. You're not responsible for her.
What's the matter, George? Miss Catherine ill. No. Miss Catherine had an injection that made her a little unsteady. What do you say about Catherine? She's gone into the garden. It's all right. She'll come back when I call her. Call her now. Miss Catherine? Miss Catherine? No, Miss Catherine. You're going to tell us the true story. Start the story. Wherever you think it started. Uh, I think it started the day he was born in this house. Oh, no, you see! Kathy! Miss Catherine, let's start a bit later than that. Shall we begin with last summer? Oh. Last summer. Yes, last summer. <clears throat> Could I? Keep that boy away from her. She wants to smoke here, Bob. Something helps in the hands. She's not it, it's all right, sister. About last summer, how did it begin? It began with his, his kindness in the six days at sea that took me so far away from the... Dueling oaks that I forgot them nearly. He was affectionate with me, so sweet and attentive to me that some people took us for a honeymoon couple until they noticed that we had separate staterooms. And then in Paris, he took me to Patou, Schiaparelli's. This is from Schiaparelli's. Bought me so many new clothes that I turned into a peacock. Of course, so was he one, too. <laughs> but then I made the mistake of re responding too much to his kindness, of taking hold of his hand before he'd take hold of mine, of holding on his arm, of leaning on his shoulder, of appreciating his kindness more than he wanted me to. And suddenly last summer he began to be restless and, oh. Go on. The Blue Jay Notebook. Did you say notebook? I know what she means by that. She's talking about the school composition book with the Blue Jay trademark that Sebastian used for making notes and revisions of his poem of summer. It went with him everywhere he went. In his jacket pocket, even his dinner jacket. I have the one he had with him last summer. Fox Hill, the Blue Jay notebook. It's with his personal effects shipped back from Cabeza de Lobo. I, I don't quite get the connection between the clothes and so forth and the Blue Jay notebook. I have it, I have it. With all these interruptions, it's going to be awfully difficult. This is important. I don't know why she mentioned the Blue Jay Notebook, but I want you to see it. Here it is, here. Title, Poem of Summer. And the date of the summer, 1935. After that, what? Blank pages. Blank pages. Nothing. Nothing but nothing last summer. I don't see what that's got to do with... His destruction? I'll tell you, Doctor. A poet's vocation is something that rests on something as thin and fine as the... the web of a spider, Doctor. Doctor, that's all that holds him over, out of destruction. Few, very few people are able to do it alone. Great help is needed. I did give it. She didn't. He's right about that. I failed him. I couldn't... I tried to... I couldn't keep the web from breaking. I, I, I tried to keep it from breaking, but I couldn't save or repair it. And now the truth's coming out. We had an agreement between us, a sort of contract or covenant between us, which he broke last summer when he broke away from me and took her with him, not me. When he was frightened, and I knew when, and what of, because his hands would shake and his eyes looked in, not out, 
I'd, I'd reach across the table and touch his hands and say not a word, just look and touch his hands with my hand until his hands stopped shaking and his eyes looked out, not in. And in the morning, the poem would be continued, continued until it was finished. I couldn't. Naturally not. He was mine. I knew how to help him. I could. You didn't. Yes. You couldn't. You see, I... I would say you will, and he would. So we went to Cabeza de Lobo. We flew down there from where he gave up writing his poem Because he'd broken yes, up. Yes, yes, something had broken that string of pearls that old mothers hold their sons. She means that I held him back from me. From destruction. All I know is that suddenly last summer, he wasn't young anymore. And we went to Cabeza de Lobo, and he suddenly changed from the evenings to the beach. From the evenings to the beach? I mean from the evenings to the afternoons, from the fashion... Fashionable. Is that the word? Yes. Suddenly last summer, Cousin Sebastian changed to the afternoons and the beach. What beach? There's a beach that's known as La Playa San Sebastian. That's where we started spending all afternoon, every day. What kind of beach was it? A big public beach near the harbor. A big public beach. <laughs> It's little statements like that that give away. After all, I've told you about his fastidiousness. You mustn't like interrupt her. Such a statement that Sebastian would go every afternoon to some dirty, free public beach near Harbor. A man that had to go out a mile in a boat to find water fit to swim in. Mrs. Venable, no matter what she says, you're going to have to let her say it without any further interruption. Or this interview will be useless. I shan't speak again. I'll keep still. If it kills me. I don't want to go on. Go on with your story. Every afternoon, you and your cousin Sebastian went out to this free public beach. No, the free one was right next to it. There was a fence between the free beach and the one that we went to. And what did you do there? Did anything happen there that disturbed you about it? Yes. What? He bought me a swimsuit I didn't want to wear. I laughed. I said, I can't wear the hat. It's a scandal to the jaybirds. What did you mean by that, that the suit was immodest? My God, yes, it was made of white lyle. The water made it transparent. I didn't want to swim in it, but he grabbed a hold of my hand and dragged me into the water all the way in, and I'd come out looking naked. Why did he do that? Did you understand why? Yes, to attract attention he wanted you to attract attention did he because he felt you were moody lonely he wanted to shock you out of your depression last summer don't you understand i was procuring for him <laughs> she used to do it too not consciously she didn't know that she was procuring for him in the, in the smart the fashionable places they used to go to before last summer sebastian was shy with people and she wouldn't neither was i we both did the same thing for him made contacts for him, but she did it in nice places and in decent ways. And I had to do it in the way I just told you. I knew what I was doing. I came out in the French Quarter years before I came out in the Garden District. Oh, Kathy, sister. Hush. Before long, the weather got warmer and the beach so crowded, he didn't need me anymore for that purpose. The ones on the free beach began to climb over the fence or swim around it. Bands of homeless young people that lived on the free beach like scavenger dogs, hungry children. So now he let me wear a decent dark suit. I'd go to a faraway empty end of the beach, write postcards and letters till it was five o'clock. Time to meet him outside the bathhouses on the street. He would come out followed. Who would follow or not? The homeless, hungry young people that had climbed over the fence from the free beach that they lived on. He'd pass out tips among them as if they'd all <laughs> shined his shoes or called taxis for him. And each day the crowd was bigger, noisier, greedier. Sebastian began to be frightened. At last we stopped going there. Then, one day, we had a late lunch at one of those open-air restaurants on the sea there. 
Sebastian was as white as the weather. He kept touching his face and throat here and there with a white silk handkerchief and popping little white pills in his mouth. I think we ought to go north, he kept saying. I think we've done, Cabeza de Lobo. I think we've done it, don't you? I thought we'd done it, but I'd learned that it was better not to seem to have an opinion because if I did, well, Sebastian, well, you know, Sebastian always preferred to do what no one else wanted to do, and I always try to give the impression of agreeing reluctantly to his wishes. It was a game. It's all right, sister. Oh, who is that? Oh, yes, that five o'clock lunch at one of those fish places along the harbor, which was fenced off with barbed wire. There were naked children along the beach, a band of frightfully thin and dark naked children that looked like a flock of plucked birds, and they'd come darting up to the barbed wire fence as if blown there by the wind, the hot, white wind from the sea, all crying out, Pan, 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 and stuffing their little black fists to their mouths and making those goblin noises with frightful grins. And he said, Don't look at those little monsters. Big as a social disease in this country. If you look at them, you get sick of the country. It spoils the whole country for you. Go on, Miss Catherine. The. The. The band of children began a serenade us. You what? Play for us on instruments, make music. If you could call it music. Oh. The, the instruments were tin cans strung together and other bits of metal which had been flattened out and made into... What? Symbols, uh, you know, and uh, others had paper bags with something on a string inside the bags which they pulled up and down, back and forth to make a sort of a, a noise like a s oompa, oompa, oompa. And all during lunch they stayed at a fairly close distance. Go on. Oh, I'm going on. Nothing could stop it now. Your cousin Sebastian, he was entertained by this concert? I think he was terrified of it. Why was he terrified of it? I think he recognized some of the boys. And what did he do? Did he do anything about it, Miss Catherine? Did he complain to the manager about it? What manager, God? Oh, no, the manager of the fish place on the beach? Oh, no, you don't understand my cousin. What do you mean? He accepted all as how things are. He thought it unfitting to ever take any action about anything whatsoever except to go on doing as something in him directed. After the salad, before they brought the coffee, he suddenly pushed himself away from the table and said, way to make them stop that. They've got to stop that. I'm not a well man. I have a heart condition. It's making me sick. This was the first time that Cousin Sebastian had ever attempted to correct a human situation. I think perhaps that that was his fatal error. It was then that the... Waiters, all eight or ten of them, charged out and beat the little musicians away with clubs and skillets and anything hard they could snatch from the kitchen. Cousin Sebastian left the table. He fled from the place, and I followed. It was all white outside, white hot, a blazing white hot, hot blazing white. At five o'clock in the afternoon in the city of. Cabeza de Lobo. It looked as if a huge white bone had caught on fire in the sky and blazed so bright that it was white and turned the sky and everything under the sky white with it. White? Yes, white. You followed your cousin Sebastian out of the restaurant onto the hot white street? Run it up and down. He ran up and down a hill. No, no, it didn't move either way. At first we were... I rarely made any suggestion, but this time I did. And what did you suggest? 
cousin Sebastian seemed to be paralyzed near the entrance of the cafe, so I said, let's go. Down that way's the waterfront. We're more likely to find a taxi near there. Or why don't we go back in and have them call us a taxi? And he said, mad, are you mad? Go back in that filthy place, never. That gang of kids shouted vile things about me to the waiters. Oh, I, I said then, and let's go down toward the docks. Let's not try to climb the hill in this dreadful heat. And Cousin Sebastian shouted, Please shut up. Let me handle this situation, will you? I want to handle this thing. And he started up the steep street with a hand stuck in his jacket where I knew he was having a pain in his chest from his palpitations. And he walked faster and faster in panic, but the faster he walked, the louder and closer it got. They'd somehow gotten through the barbed wire and out onto the street and were following, following. Sebastian started to run. They all screamed at once. They seemed to fly in the air. They outran him so quickly. I screamed. I heard Sebastian scream. He screamed just once before that flock of black plucked little birds pursued him and overtook him halfway up the hill. And what did you do then? Ran. Ran? Ran where? Down. Oh, I ran down. The easier direction to run was down, 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 screaming out help all the way till waiters, police and others ran out of buildings and rushed back up the hill with me. And when we got to where Sebastian had disappeared in that flock of featherless little black sparrows, he was lying naked as they had been naked against a white wall and this you won't believe nobody has believed it nobody could believe it nobody nobody on earth could possibly believe it and I don't blame them They had devoured parts of him. <laughs> Torn or cut parts of him away and stuffed them into those gobbling, fierce little empty black mouths of theirs. There wasn't a sound anymore. There was nothing to see but Sebastian. <laughs> what was left of him. It looked like a big white paper wrapped bunch of red roses that had been torn, thrown, crushed. I can't set plays in what? Whoa. Mom, I'll get a job. Son. Doctor, can't you say something? I think we ought to at least consider the possibility that the girl's story could be true.